I'm here with Robert Kelly. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, you've written, you're an archaeologist. You've written a number of books. Um, and one of them, I believe it's your most recent book, The Fifth Beginning, is um, it's it's a, a great book that is a, to be a subject of a, a podcast because it really covers the sweep of human history. Uh, but that also means there's there's a lot to talk about. Um, so if we can, let's, let's dive right in <clears throat> the, um, these beginnings, they're sort of what are sometimes commonly referred to as like these revolutions in history. Um, and we can maybe start off with the invention of tools. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about on this subject is there are apparently other animals that have used tools. There's been some scuttlebutt about, uh, chimps maybe, you know, using very like primitive stone tools. Um, and there's clearly a competitive advantage. If you can extract more energy from the environment, you can cook things, et cetera. Um, why, why did this not happen? This sort of uh, intelligence mutation? Why didn't this happen at all during the dinosaur period when there was apparently much more time for these sorts of uh, mutations to develop? Um, why did it take all the dinosaurs getting killed off for this to happen? Well, I, I guess I might say we don't know for certain that uh, that there weren't some some dinosaurs that were using. Maybe T. Rex was doing something with those little tiny arms it it had there, but probably not. So I I really can't tell you why um, it didn't happen before it it did happen, and, and we don't even know when. Um, uh, the primate line started using some started using tools that may have been quite a long long time ago there's some suggestion that some of the very earliest stone tools and we're talking about things that are about three three million years old here are actually not associated with the human line but might actually be uh chimpanzee uh tools so 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 there isn't a good answer to it why did they why did other critters not know, not start using stone tools. I don't have a good answer for you. And part of it is we don't know exactly when that that started because the earliest stone tools are very difficult to recognize as uh, as as tools. And some of the tools that chimps use are organic. Uh, they're sticks, they're little termite sticks or leaves to soak up water out of uh, tree tree hollows. So they they will not preserve over uh, a million year time period. No, we won't we won't find those. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a T Rex was using tools, and they just <laughs> yeah. lost the history. I just I don't want to see somebody citing citing me as saying T Rex used tools. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hard to prove a negative. I, I see your point. Um, but w this this period this very early period of hominids. Uh, is something that is kind of um, among certain parts of the population, kind of like almost romanticized um, and felt as though this was a, a glorious past uh, to which we will never return. And that uh, modern life is just not suited for our biologies. Um, is this or people back then or is there any evidence that they could have been happier? Uh, I mean, I know it's a hard thing to look for in the archaeological record. But do you have any sense about the the mental well being of these kinds of people? And in, 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 people look back on the human past, and up until the nineteen sixties, most people would have looked back on that past as, "Well, oh, thank God that's over. We right. would never want to go back to that." And after the nineteen sixties, when we started to recognize many. Uh, ills of modern life, pollution, uh, over overcrowding. This is when we start having fears about overpopulating the the planet, um, it, um, destroying our environment through acid rain and the pollution of of rivers. I grew up next to the Housatonic River, which would sometimes run purple, sometimes catch fire. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, it was a world that people looked at and said, my God, there has to be something better than this. And many people found it looking into the 
the past as some kind of um, a foil. Uh, there was probably things to admire about our ancient hunting and gathering past, and probably some things we would find greatly disturbing if we had to go back in in time. I'm not the only one um, who is here with us today who would probably be dead if it weren't for modern medical uh, care. That That's a great thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We live uh, longer lives and we live longer lives with fewer pains than hunting and gathering people's um, experienced in the, in the past. At the same time, they lived in a, a, a beautiful natural environment that they often saw it as providing everything that they pretty much needed. They had very few wants, so they sort of had everything that they wanted. It was a very uh, perfectly Zen uh, life lifestyle. Um, they uh, they tended not to be too worried about the future, not worried about politics because there weren't really <laughs> there weren't wasn't polit politics. Right. Uh, they didn't live under terribly crowded conditions. And if they had difficulties with their family or the other people that they were living with in their band, which was probably 20 to 25 people, they solved those problems by just moving. They could do that. That's a much more difficult thing to do today. Um, during the housing crisis of some years ago, people were stuck in houses that they couldn't afford to sell and they couldn't afford to just leave them behind. That they were stuck. Hunter gatherers are never stuck. They can just pack up and move and they can pretty much make a living almost anywhere that they wanted to go. So that's a, that was really the ultimate freedom there and an easy solution to, to social problems. You just vote with your feet, move. Yeah. So there were, there were there were things that were good and things that were probably not not so good. Yeah, it, it's interesting the the point that you just made about people being much more rooted today and staying in one spot and not having that same amount of flexibility. And yet at the same time, the rate of change, technological, social, cultural, has, has really picked up. And so just the fact that you have this freedom of movement is in some ways kind of conducive to like stagnation. Um, when you talk about the tribal politics or the, the politics of your band of people, um, what, what, what were like the leadership structures back then? Was there a, a singular, uh, what they would call quote unquote alpha male um, or how did that work? Um, the, the leadership structures in those societies were, um, probably, um, they, they weren't set in stone. There weren't, there, there was not an office that people could move through the way that modern state societies have offices, president, prime, prime minister, um, mayor. These are, these are offices that exist independent of the person and the rights and responsibilities of that office don't go with the person, they go with the office. So people move in and out of those offices. In the distant past, in, in hunting and gathering societies, the nature of, of a leader would very much be tied to the leader, um, the, the leader him or herself. So, uh, and, they, and they led not so much by, by power, by coercion, they couldn't really do that. They led really by example, by trying to encourage people, like cajole people, um, convince them. Um, they would usually have been people who would have been good with uh, la language. And they were probably people who were fairly competent at what they did. So if there was one man who's a very good hunter and the other men followed him, did what he suggested doing, it wasn't because he was going to coerce them into it it was because it was probably in those guys best interest to do what he was suggesting because he had a proven track track record 
if someone tried to use that position to coerce others, people would probably just lead him. He'd get up one morning and everyone would be gone. Wow. And uh, that was just, and there's actually ethnographic instances of this. If anybody who considered, if they considered you to be kind of, of a predatory leader, they would just walk away from you. That's how they solved social problems. Just walk away because they didn't really need you. They could make their lives perfectly well someplace else without you. What would happen to those abandoned leaders? Well, um, they might be left on their own with, with maybe with their family or a couple of people who felt, ah, we can't leave the guy, you know, um, he may eventually come back with his tail tucked between his legs and, uh, and probably be re readmitted, you know, appropriately admonished and doesn't do that again. Yeah. There, there, there's accounts in ethnographies of, of that happening among, you know, living hunting and gatherers of the past century. You, you also mentioned there um, someone who's sort of like an effective leader, uh, although not set in stone in an office, as you said, uh, him or herself. There's kind of a perception that the further back in time, the uh, more socially backwards people were. Uh, w were women in charge of things, uh, uh, you know, in these sorts of societies? The, in, in those nomadic hunting and gathering societies, men and women had much more uh, equal uh, avenues to prestige and equal avenues to uh, authority. They might do it through different avenues. A man is almost certainly going to do it um, most commonly through uh, hunting prowess. He could also become a, a, a shaman and uh, adopt um, the capacity to talk with the dead, talk with the supernatural world. Um, Women could also do that. Women may also have avenues to um, positions of authority and prestige through their ability to use the plant world, both for food, but also for uh, medicine, uh, clothing, maybe other other sorts of, of tools um, so, so that they could each acquire positions of authority and prestige not necessarily coercive power, um, maybe soft power by virtue of what they knew, uh, but but they might have acquired those through different avenues. I see. And, and you talk about these uh, shamans, or, or I've always said shaman. I don't know if there's a, a real pronunciation. Um, oh. Okay. Okay. Um, what what were these figures like? I mean, there I guess there wasn't a real sort of set in stone priesthood at this time. Um, and, and how you, you look at things like the uh, the Oracle of Delphi, and they talk about these sort of uh, weird vapors in the air, and it sounds a lot like they're literally intoxicated on some kind of whatever substance. How were people? Uh, getting their sort of spiritual connection in this time? Were they, you know, purely just out of belief? Were they getting high on something? Or did they do chants? Or what was that like? They're, they're, shamans can go into a trance-like state that can be induced through a number of different ways. Um, if people discovered that there were certain plants they could ingest that would do it, mushrooms, for example, um, that were avail available in some environments, not not all. Um, the the folks in southern Africa, like the Jutquazi, uh, also known as the the Kung uh, folks, they would do it by uh, dancing, by just this dance that would go on for hours and hours and hours, and it would put them into a trance like state. Here in uh, North America, the indigenous folks would often um, go on a vision quest that usually entailed um, going up on top of a mountain, uh, lying down, and just staying there for several days without food or, or water. And if you do that for without food or water for several days, you'll 
you'll start to hallucinate. And their, their, it was their interpretation of the visions uh, that they had during this, this time that, that really mattered. To them, those, those, uh, those visions, however they were acquired, was them connecting with some other world, with a supernatural world, perhaps with the dead, perhaps with forest spirits, uh, with some other level of uh, existence. And then they would come back and usually talk with some older person who had already been through all of this to try and understand what did this vision all mean? Yeah. And it's most likely that some of the rock art that we see around the world, like the best known is the, the rock art that's deep inside European caves that was done anywhere from 10 to 30,000 year, years ago. This is probably somebody repeating what they saw mm -hmm. on, on a vision as their effort to try and understand what was that vision all about. Right. Yeah, that must have been so wild before any notion of science or, you know, modern understanding to have these hallucinations. You, you would probably have to, the most reasonable conclusion would be to say that this really was some otherworldly experience. It, it, it's, a, it's a completely reasonable thing to think. And, of course, people today have dreams and they wake up in the morning and re recount to their loved one, hey, this, I had this weird dream last night. And, and they'll usually finish their telling of the dream with, what do you think that means? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have a different way of interpreting it. It's your brain debugging or you're worried about your ill grandmother or, or something. But we have, we offer ways to explain it as well. Totally. Yeah, there's just the need to explain and, and whatever feels most reasonable. You yeah, know. yeah. Well, the I, I want to ask again on the subject of people having this sort of romanticized view of the past, because you, you bring this up very early on uh, in the book, um, the fifth beginning, um, where it, I think the guy's name is like Otzi. Uh, I'm, I'm, I might be pronouncing it. Yeah. And see, this, yeah. this guy found in the Alps where... Yeah. Um, the general conclusion um, is that he he comes from this sort of period of time and he was murdered probably by someone he knew. Yeah, um, that's what I think. That's what I think. What, okay. Can can you explain who this guy was, why you think he was murdered? Well, Otsi was um, probably just a regular dude of about 5,000 years ago who lived in uh, the Alps uh, region, was born and raised there. Um, and, uh, he, he, he died about 5,000 years ago up on literally on top of a mountain in the, uh, Italian Alps. Um, and it just so happens that at, right after he died, he's probably buried in snowfall and he eventually becomes buried underneath some, uh, something of an ice cap, not enough to really crush him. He was kind of down in a, a low swale with some rocks protecting him so his body isn't completely crushed and he stays there frozen for the next 5,000 years until global warming melts the ice away and his body gets exposed he's found by some um, hikers in the uh, early 90s I, th I believe 1991 uh, they thought they were looking at somebody who had died in a you know, last year or the year before, the body was that well preserved. And they, of course, called in some authorities who started to recover it. And they said, this is, this is not a recent death. Um, and he was, we have like everything, uh, uh, everything, <laughs> all the clothes he was wearing, the leggings and his, um, his, his tunic and a, a sort of a, a, a cape and a, a hat and his bow and arrows and a copper-headed uh, axe and this remarkable array of stuff. It's this unbelievable view into a single individual from 5,000 years ago. And at first people assumed, well, he probably, maybe he had a heart attack climbing up this mountain. 
He's about 45 years old or so. So eh, it, that could happen. Once they did an x-ray of him, they discovered a stone arrowhead that had entered his body from the back and had entered him in exactly the right place you would want to put it if your intention was to kill the guy. Mm. Uh, and there's some other marks on his hands that look like cut marks. They look like defensive wounds. And just recently, they've they've noticed some other damage on the skull that might have been somebody coming up and and striking him uh, on the on the head to make sure that he was that he was dead, or he could have fallen and struck his head. We don't we don't know, but it does look like he met you know a violent uh, death. Okay, so I, I thought. Uh, I thought it was earlier than that, but 5,000 years ago. Um, okay. And, and part of why I brought this up is because the, this image of a, a you know, a pastoral uh, past or, or, or a peaceful past um, is something that I think is maybe complicated by stories like this. Um, I, I heard Ted Bundy of all people once the, the serial killer say that, Ooh. uh, he thought that, um, you know, serial killing was just a sort of a construct of, of modern industrial life. And that, uh, you know, he, he said uh, if he could do it all over again, he would have just been a lumberjack, uh, you know, lived out in the woods, um, which is like kind of amusing. But at the same time, I guess I, I wonder and I'd like to ask you, uh, were there things like serial killers as such back then? Uh, people who just like randomly killed for sport? Uh, that's a that's a very difficult, perhaps impossible thing for us to record from archaeological data to yeah. see in archaeological. Yeah, yeah. We can see um, instances of of violence in the past, going back uh, as much as fourteen thousand year, years ago. There's pretty a pretty clear um, case in uh, uh, in Egypt of a of a fourteen thousand year old. It's it's it was a, a an attack by one group on another where they they killed people and they probably uh, executed some 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 people, uh, and then someone came back and buried them all. Uh, we can see instances like that. And there is quite a lively debate in archaeology as to exactly how violent was the past. Were, were human societies more violent in the past than they are uh, today? And the, unfortunately, our data are so limited at the moment that the answer is we don't really know the answer. We can find evidence of um, of all kinds of violence in the past. Some of it's clearly um, clearly murder. Um, some of it's probably accidents. Uh, people with broken noses, that can be fist fights. Or other people might have broken their noses the way I broke mine, which was playing a rather vigorous basketball game against my son. You know, that, that stuff happens. People fall. They break their nose on a rock. So it's hard for us to interpret that. And we can we do see cases of it, of, of extraordinary violence in the past, uh, into the hunting and gathering past, whether they were more violent than today, than modern societies today, I we we do not know the answer to that to that question. Well, that, that's interesting to hear because, you know, I'm sure you've seen like the, the sort of the Steven Pinker uh, rosy view of things that, you know, oh, we are the least violent we've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, while, of course, you know, the sort of the millions of people that get killed in World War One, World War Two, it's like, oh, well, the human population is this much bigger. So as right. a proportion, you know, we are less violent. Right. Um, but certainly these kinds of like large scale cataclysmic wars uh were not happening um say fifty thousand plus years ago or or were they well there there certainly wasn't war in the sense that we know war today war war today entails a a, a in some cases a, a professional 
military class. That's what they do. That's what they're paid for. Uh, it involves a whole technological complex whose only purpose is to kill people. That was certainly not true 50,000 years ago. If there was murders happening, it happened using the same tools that they used for hunting, uh, or one's bare hands, a handy rock or log. It, it's, um, it didn't involve, it, it certainly wasn't common enough that it made sense to remove a chunk of the population from sort of food production, food acquisition, into a professional military class. That doesn't happen until we have state societies and agricultural production, and in fact, intensive agricultural production, where um, they could afford to remove people from that productive class and put them into a military class. So we don't have that kind of fighting 50,000 years ago. Steven Pinker's data, uh, he's relying really on ethnographic cases and assuming that those ethnographic cases are typical of the distant past. That's always a, that is a fraught um, assumption to, to make uh, on almost any, for almost any behavior. It's very difficult to, to look at hunter-gatherers of the last century that we know from ethnographic data mm -hmm. and impose those, those behaviors onto the, the distant past. But that, that's what Pinker did. And he's, he's probably wrong. And, and his, you know, others have gone through his, the, the data that he has in uh, his book, Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, and shown that it's, it's incorrect. Some of it's not hunter-gatherer. Uh, data. Um, he didn't. He didn't use. He wasn't very critical in the use of those of those data. He's probably more right when you start looking at medieval times to the to the present. That the level of violence has probably gone down over over time. Okay, so uh, he's just working with a better set of of data there. Right. Um, I, I didn't know that he took hunter gatherers of today and extrapolated that to tens of thousands of years ago. I wasn't aware of that. Um, I, think, I think he might have some archaeological cases in there, but at the time he wrote the book, we didn't have very many. And um, the archaeological data has since been gone through, in part because of his book. Archaeologists went through the existing data from the world, and um, it's it's extremely difficult to use. You can cherry pick what, whatever you want and come up with the story you want. But there's been a recently a very nice study um, looking at both the ethnographic and the archaeological data by some outsiders. Th these are people who have no dog in this fight. Right. And, and their answer is, boy, these, these data are really difficult to draw any conclusion. You know, that my, might go ahead. My my answer to it is, if you're asked the, the question, were people more violent in the past than today? Yeah. And you're expecting to get a yes or no answer. That's that's the wrong expectation. In the past, there were times when people were very violent and times when they were not. We can see this in archaeological data. So the, the question isn't, were they more violent in the past? The question is really, under what conditions did they see violence as a logical response? Rather than just going, hey, I'm out of here and, and leave. Okay. And that, that we, can, we can analyze that. And when we analyze that, it really looks like when population uh, densities are high, and environmental productivity is takes a takes a dip. That's when you get violence. People's backs are against the wall. Fighting is a logical response, but it's only a logical response as the last resort. When population density is high and environmental production goes down. Yeah. So basically, the equivalent of a recession or a depression or something. Sure. Okay. Yes. But that, yeah. very similar yeah but that wouldn't be 
calling it a recession or depression that that wouldn't really adequately describe what you're talking about in terms of environmental production it 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 wouldn't because recessions depressions are those are really only used with monetary uh, uh, economies okay. and they're well i personally find them quite mysterious how they how they arise because you yeah. can have sort of yeah there's plenty of there's plenty of food out there right. but somehow the price of it has has gone up so much that people can't afford to get access to it because they don't have enough money for it. Okay. It's part of like wheat out of Ukraine. I mean, it drives the prices up because wheat becomes rare because why we're not producing it. No, we're producing the wheat. We just can't get it out of one of the major wheat producing regions of the world. Yeah. That that's the part that seems weird and artificial. I think to people about modern life where you talk about, yeah. uh, you know, Oh, there hasn't been a giant flood that that may have washed away all the crops that that probably happened all the time tens of thousands of years ago, and that I think would fall under this category you're talking about of a dip in environmental production. It's yeah, we have all the resources here. We have plenty of work to be done. Plenty of people who want to do the work, and somehow these components are not fitting together adequately. There's some sort of you know glitch in the system. Um. That you mentioned also in there, uh, the rise of state violence um, and the fact that that was really only possible when you had this rise in agriculture, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, the five beginnings you talk about in this book. Um, but I, I don't want to skip the rise of culture as well, which feels like a an interesting um, uh, sort of way to like capture these this specific set of changes. Um, people, I. I could be wrong, but normally I, I don't think of people talking about uh, like the cultural revolution in the same way people would say the industrial revolution or agriculture revolution. Um, w- what exactly are you talking about here? The, the, the cultural revolution uh, or the cultural beginning. Yeah. Revolution sounds violent to me. I prefer beginnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that that beginning, uh, which which I labeled as the, the second uh, beginning um, is uh, really when humans became human a- as we know them and that and because they became capable of very abstract thought and capable of thinking about worlds that do not physically exist for example the world of the dead uh, a supernatural world um Nobody ever actually saw Zeus and all the other Greek gods, but they still thought that they were there and very much active in people's in people's lives. Uh, th- 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 this is really the human capacity to to think about these worlds and to accept them as completely real, completely totally real. This is this is really an amazing ability, and it's what gives us the ability to to produce art and to produce stories and and dance and music. All of those things stem from that, really from that that capacity. And it's signaled in in the archeological record as cave art uh, in in Europe, um, but also as things like uh, shell beads that were manufactured to be be worn probably as uh, necklaces perhaps sewn onto clothing, ostrich eggshell beads, carvings on stone, things that we can't even really, we can't interpret what they, what they are, but we know that they are something that carried meaning for, for people. Uh, this, is, this is really when humans yeah, became, became human. And they started thinking about how life as it is supposed to be and life as it is actually lived. And I suspect that the reason culture be, um, became, it became synonymous with, with being human is because it had an enormous evolutionary uh, advantage. And that advantage is by being able to think about how life uh, is supposed to be and how life actually is allows you to to constantly think about 
trying to make life as it is lived into life as it is supposed to be. Hmm. So that if your you know, younger sibling dies and you're, you're wondering, that, this, I feel awful. Life is not supposed to be awful. Life is supposed to be happy. Why did my sibling die? And you can start thinking up reasons for it. It may be that it's, it was a forest spirit that infected the body. It may be a ghost. Or, it, or someone may think he ate something he shouldn't have eaten. He ate some plant. So now we've perhaps learned something about, about the environment. Don't eat those plants. Johnny ate it and he died. So it, it helps you acquire knowledge, which then becomes useful in the future. It's passed down. Don't eat this. Um, it allows you to think about how to make life work better. And once once humans became cultural, and we don't know exactly when that happened, yeah. I, I used to say about 50,000 years ago, but I now suspect it was earlier than, than that, 100,000 or so years ago, um, humans must have been constantly trying to intentionally improve their lives. This is, um, that's different. That makes us different than any other animal on, yeah. the, on the planet. Yeah, and, and the, this idea of, okay, what is the evolutionary advantage of having culture? And you point to uh, an ability to sort of self-reflect and self-improve. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it's kind of an interesting concept uh, to, to compare to, um, you know, sort of the art for art's sake movement um where people would say hey uh you know people criticize people like oscar wilde who were, who were big into this and mm -hmm. he would say listen art is not meant to edify it's not meant to educate it's not meant to self-improve we're, we're just you know we're not here to moralize and uh we're just here to you know put out something beautiful and it seems as though what you're saying is like okay that's fine but that may not be originally what culture was intended for, or even why culture is adaptive. Is that fair to say? It's it's um it might be a sort of an ancillary effect of of culture, but it's the a product of people who are desperately trying to think about what what is life supposed to be like and why isn't life the way it's supposed to be. And, and trying to deal with that that paradox that between life as it's actually lived and life as 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 they think it's supposed to be lived. So they're they're sort of constantly thinking about that. Um, the the artist Norman Norman Rockwell, I, I think is a, a brilliant example of this. He, he, he was, his life is miserable. His life was quite sad. It entailed divorce and sort of mental illness, and it was and never being accepted as a as a as an artist because he painted the covers of Sad Saturday Evening Post, and he often painted things that today people look back and go, "Oh, this is so, uh, this is such a rosy view of human life." And yeah. here's the cop sitting on the 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 cafe stool talking to the little boy who's going to run away from home and we know that the cop is sort of convincing him ah yeah your parents are okay why don't you go back to, and uh, and people look at that and go geez what a what a naive view of of life yeah. norman rockwell did not have a naive view of of life uh all you have to do is look at his painting of the the young african-american girl being escorted to to, to a desegregated school by by policemen with the n-word scratched on the wall behind her he, he knew full well what was going on in life but this to me he's an artist who's trying to reckon the the difference between life as it's lived and life as it's supposed to be lived you're not supposed to live in a world where a little girl has to be escorted by cops to school that 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 to him, I'm sure, was just mind blowing. How could this possibly exist? And I suspect most artists are, at some level, I, I'm going to disagree with Oscar Wilde here. At some level, they're trying to cope with that, with that fact. 
right? Oscar yeah. Wilde was gay and he lived at a time when he could have been put to death for it. Right, and he was in prison for it, yeah. He went to prison for it, absolutely. So all, I, all he wants to do is love the people he wants to love. What, what's the problem here? Why, right. why does that act put me in danger of, of being executed? You know, of, of being uh, my death being sanctioned, it, it's that's sort of this mismatch in in life, and he's he's trying to figure that. I see Oscar Wilde is trying to figure that all out. Yeah, I I think maybe um what what that sort of artistic philosophy is getting at is that uh, you know in art as compared to like the sciences where you are trying to find answers, like as an archaeologist. You you uh, you're mulling over questions, but I, I assume you're trying to find answers in your work. Sure. Um, whereas in art, it feels more like you're just sort of like framing the question in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And I I maybe that's why we feel when we see something like a Norman Rockwell um, or you know art that is particularly preachy and heavy-handed, even if we agree with the message. It's like, eh, like this isn't really what I'm I'm here for, um, and maybe there there's an adaptive advantage to that in terms of just saying like, okay, we're going to give you a question to mull over and give you a question that's like uh, particularly thought provoking, um, but I don't know. It all depends on its context, you know. It, it all depends on the context. I, you, you know, you listen to Beethoven's music. Yeah. And 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 we think, well, oh, this is just you know, it's just classical music. It's 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 it's. I want to listen to something else, right? It's, it's for some people, it doesn't speak to them, yeah. and they don't know that Beethoven. It, it, my piano teacher told me if Beethoven had been alive today, this was the nineteen seventies. Uh, he 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 said Beethoven would be writing rock rock music. Not classical music. He'd be oh, writing yeah. music. That was the equivalent. That's what his music was considered rock and roll of his of his day. It was that sort of uh, out there. It, it was renegade stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, and and yet some of these th those artists, ah, you know, m many of those classical uh, um, musicians, they 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 thought they were God was speaking through them. And so it's why Salieri couldn't stand Mozart because Mozart was a, a pretty profane, you know, obscene guy, yeah. and and yet he wrote this music that was. I mean, it's the voice of God is what, people listen to it, and that's what they thought they were listening to. Right. Nobody thinks that really about the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, but. Yeah. No. And I and I'm yeah I'm dating myself here. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, Beatles and Rolling Stones still relevant. Um, the the when you you mentioned earlier in there, uh, placing the development of culture something like a hundred thousand years ago, um, there was an event you talk about in the book that I find just fascinating. Where I think it's like the the Mount Toba explosion. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, where it's like humans were almost totally wiped out. Um, what uh, what happened there? Mount Toba is in um, Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia. It blew off about 75,000 years ago. Um, it was, oh, as near as we can tell, probably the big, biggest volcanic eruption in a long, long time. I forget exactly how, how long. Huge, huge uh, eruption. Would have created a sort of nuclear winter around much of the the globe mm -hmm. and uh which has sort of knock-on effects um and the human population may very well have declined to a near extinction stage most most animal populations if they if that population declines to a certain point then it just boom it's gone it right. just plummets to zero and apparently the human population passed through a filter at about that time. It's a little difficult for us to take to date events uh, back in that that time period. We can't date them, you know, like 
we can date the Vesuvius eruption. We know when that happened, AD 79, I believe. Yeah. We know the day that it happened, right? Since Pliny was sitting there recording it as it was happening. Um, uh, it's a little bit hard for us to to line up those those events, but it sure looks like it had a dramatic effect on the on the human population and almost drove that population to extinction. How when you say almost extinction around like what order of magnitude in terms of the numbers of population? I have seen an estimate as low as ten thousand. Wow. So you got about five thousand men, five thousand women. That's that is that's dang few people to repopulate the earth. And how spread out geographically were these people? Well, you had they're primarily in Africa. There is um, at seventy five thousand. There would have been a Neanderthal population in uh, Europe, which um, most people regard as a subspecies. Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, because yeah. we we definitely, when I say we, I mean Homo sapiens sapiens, when they moved into Europe at about 40,000 years ago, 45,000 years ago, um, they definitely interbred with Neander Neanderthals. Anyone mm. of European descent uh, has a couple of percent, small percentage of Neanderthal genes in their bodies. So, and yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, uh, it's there were also people, the Denisovans, who were similar to Neanderthals, but not quite the same. We don't know much about them. They're over in uh, Asia, and our, our ability to estimate how heavily impacted they were by that eruption is harder to say. We don't have enough research in that part of the world at that time time period to to say. Okay, so, so so there were there were people in Africa, Europe, and Asia. Yeah, there was, in my opinion, no one in the New World. Okay, and, and um, why 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 do you say that there was no one there yet? Because the archaeological evidence shows that there wasn't anybody here until there were people in the New World, definitely by thirteen and a half thousand years ago. And I'm thinking south of Canada, south of the major um, ice age ice sheets, which completely covered Canada at one point. Um, they were in Alaska by 14, a little more than 14,000 years ago. But this is a subject that is hotly debated by uh, archaeologists. There are some who say 16,000 years ago, others who say 33,000 years ago. Some say 130,000 years ago. I think the evidence is not good um, for anything older than about 14 and a half thousand years. Okay. I'm, not, I'm, I'm personally not convinced yet. And when we pass through this filter of like maybe as low as 10,000 people, um, this, like, I, obviously that sort of restricts our gene pool. Um, and uh, curious because on the other side of this the people who survived um they had uh, what we would now recognize as language um and i, I think that that came about something we think like maybe like eighty thousand years ago a uh, hundred thousand years ago or no uh, really hard for us to say that because yeah. language doesn't fossilize um but given that people were uh expressing themselves through abstract means um they almost certainly had language behind that in okay. order to, to you, you, it's you can communicate some some basic things with a very basic fundamental um uh, language that's maybe something more similar to chimpanzee calls or something yeah but to talk about a world that doesn't exist or that you can't see and touch that requires a language capable of talking about abstract things that probably almost certainly goes back more than more than a hundred thousand years maybe two hundred thousand we we don't know and i'm not sure that we'll ever have the answer to that although i would never say never because 
um, in the last 50 years, I, I've seen methods come along that I would never have predicted when I was in college. Yeah. Um, but I guess w w what I'm sort of driving at is the dinosaurs had like a, an extinction level event. And this in many ways feels kind of similar. Um, and yet we survived it. And yeah. so is it, you know, maybe if the dinosaurs had been super smart, would they have survived uh, their extinction event? What, like, what was adaptive about human beings that made us the exception? The, um, the what makes humans the, the exception is uh, tech, technology that allows them to move into new environments and adapt the technology for the particular food resources of that environment. It's what allowed us to move into the Arctic. A human can't live in the Arctic unless they have a considerable uh, clothing te technology. You have to be able to sew. You have, you have to be able to make all of that, that clothing. Otherwise, obviously, you can't survive in the, yeah. in the Arctic. So humans had the capacity to do that, to experiment with new foods. Um, it, probably a lot of people got belly aches or died after eating something that they shouldn't have eaten. Yeah. Um, uh, but we have the capacity to do that. Animals can't adapt in that way uh, as as quickly. They mostly have to adapt through biological uh, evo evolution. Humans can speed that whole process up with te technology. And, and you know what? That that kind of points to what we're talking about in the beginning of this, where people say that oh, modern times, we our evolution hasn't caught up with our environment, and so. Uh, we're out of joint and we feel uh, that's why we're so depressed and anxious, et cetera. But it seems like what you're saying is that, no, we are we are most adapted to rapid adaptation. And that is sort of uh, what we're like the situation we're in right now. Maybe, you know, testing the limits of that. But um, that that's, I guess, what what has made us always survive. That's what saved us. Um yeah. yeah it's it's you know evolution really doesn't care about your quality of life yeah <laughs> especially once you've reproduced and raised your offspring to um to reproductive age evolution doesn't care what happens to you that's yeah. why i think things like the the all the old age diseases things like cancer haven't been removed from evolution hasn't removed those because it, most of that happens after you're sort of done with what you're supposed to do as far as evolution is concerned, which is reproduce. Um, so uh, the ev evolution doesn't really care about the quality of life. We care about the quality of our, of our lives. Is the quality of our life better or worse than it was when we were hunter gatherers? We're kind of going back to what you started with. Um, it's, it, it's very hard for us to say, would, would hunter-gatherers, were they completely satisfied with their lives? I'm going to bet no. Uh, that's what sort of drives change over over time. Um, are we biologically ill-equipped for the world that we live in today? I, I, I think sociology and psychological experiments have, have shown this to be to be true. We really don't do well in extremely crowded environments. We don't do well in crowded environments that have no access to uh, nature. We we know all these all these these things. Whether we have to go back and um, uh, understand that they're derived from our distant past, I don't know if that's so important. We can right. we can tell today that people don't like living under in crowded apartment blocks with no sort of way to escape all the noise and uh, just the other people bearing down upon you. That's that's common across humanity. They all need some place to, to get away and reflect. So yeah. we know this and we have the capacity to develop um, the places where we live to, to reflect that. We just, the, 
the powers that be have not seen fit to do that. The powers that be that, yeah. that kind of, um, when you talk about, uh, and I do want to get agriculture in here, um, because, and that's kind of a good segue because the, the, the sort of a uh, basic story that I've been told is that, uh, the real social stratification, uh, was able to happen once we had agriculture, because then you had, uh, you know, surplus food and okay, what do you do with this surplus? We're going to divide it up evenly. No, there's going to be a, a noble class, a priestly class. Is that roughly how things happened or is that a uh, too simple to be, um, explained? It's, it's, it's roughly how things, how things happened. I mean, in, in hunting and gathering societies, we do see some uh, construction of sur surplus. Um, it's usually not massive sur surplus. It's usually enough for the lean season, and then there's nothing left. So you store up enough food for the winter, and come spring, everyone's really pretty desperate to, to get out and start exploiting the early spring plants and get to the animals and so on. Um, so uh, the, the, the construction of, of, um, of a hierarchy is made possible by surplus because you're going to remove some people from the food production realm. Um, and uh, those people then have to come up with some explanation for why they're not out in the fields working. Right. And that, that explanation is where we start seeing the development of ideas about different classes of, of people. So ancient Egyptian pharaohs would explain the fact that they live in a palace. You work for me. I don't work for you. You build my tomb. I don't build your tomb because I'm descended from Ra. I'm descended from the sun god. Are you? No, you're not. Because if you were, you'd be living here instead of me. It's a nice circular. Right. Reason. Right. But that was their explanation for it. I'm of a different order of human than than you it's also what allows slavery to happen you're not really human you're not really human basically is what it comes down to is us imposing these abstract category these people are human these people are not these right. people are worthy of what they get these people are worthy of all that they don't have they're not worthy to get to get more than that and that can happen in any way possible. You and I see no difference between the English and the Irish. But when the English took over Ireland a thousand years ago, they saw them as little better than little better than animals. Right. And, and yet you and I would look at the Irish and the English and go, there's no difference. And there isn't. But, but the English saw an enormous difference. It, it's the part that's fascinating about that is that w whenever these sort of king, like in, in Egypt, this sort of nobility took power, uh, I, I would love to have seen, okay, how did that actually start? Because when people have this story that they tell themselves about why they're in power, I, I can imagine that if you're a few generations in and you're, you're, you can't see how it began, you can sort of believe your own hype and a lot of them probably did believe you know oh i you know oh, absolutely it, but it's like okay the first people to do that to snatch up some grain and say hey i'm, I'm a descendant of, of god leave me alone like were they just total shysters or like how did you, you know what i mean they were probably trying to protect their advantage because they're living in a world where it's um, the option of simply moving away is not really an option. Yeah. For hunter-gatherers, the option is, is sort of open, especially in the distant past. The option was open to just move. And it, But if you're an agriculturalist, you're now limited to arable land. And in some cases, that arable land is going to come at a dear cost. You're going to have to remove the forest to get to the arable land under the forest. Yeah. You might have to irrigate property to make your piece of land uh, produce anything at all. So there's this enormous amount of, of effort 
that can go into that piece of, of land. And moving, since agriculture appears when human population is, is increasing, it's highly likely that the next piece of arable land, which is right, not right next door to you, but is probably over in the, the next uh, river valley, that's already occupied by somebody. So if you want it, it's the cost is you're going to have to displace the people who are are there. So suddenly you have um, a, a, a distinct need to protect what is yours. Right. Yeah. And it's um, the fact that there, there are two things that occurred to me as you were saying that one, this mobility and oh, you know, now you can't just leave and go to the, you know, the next sort of nice spot to, to hang out at um, when things aren't going well, you're, you're rooted. Um, and there's this kind of societal, maybe you could call it sociopathy, where you have people at the top, uh, really just sort of, you could say stealing from the rest of their society, or at least holding a, a firm grip. Um, and nowadays, what sort of characterizes like a sociopath is like the guy who comes into town, causes a bunch of mayhem and then leaves and is not responsible to the, the broader society, just doesn't have any attachment to anyone in any place. And, you know, sort of flutters about uh, causing problems wherever they go. Um, it, it's just, I don't quite know what to do with that thought, but it's just an interesting contrast in how, um, you talked about people moving about and there's this sort of Zen-like attitude of wherever we go, it provides for us. And then, you know, being rooted sort of breaks that Zen. And that's when you can start getting things like who owns what territory, maybe borders can start appearing, things like that. Yeah. Um, and this is something that a guy like Ted Kaczynski, for instance, the uh, famous anarchist and anti-civilization guy, uh, would point to, and not just him, but other people without the the violent inclinations, uh, would point to as like, okay, this is this is where we made the big mistake when we developed agriculture, we settled down. Uh, how do you feel about that? Like, was this just inevitable? Well, I think it was. In, I I actually think agriculture was uh, inevitable. Um because we had plants that were capable of being sort of manipulated um, to become more, more productive. All of our domesticated plants are of course derived from wild ancestors that were not terribly productive, but they had the capacity to be, to become productive. I mean, the original corn is teosinte. It's about as big as your pinky. It's nothing like what you buy in the supermarket today which is actually genetic mutants uh, yeah. that were produced through just selection over, over many, many gener generations. So I, I think it's inevitable that this would happen. Um, and that's going to happen as long as you have a human population that's growing in size and it's growing in size because it's, it's clever. It's found ways to sort of cheat nature and no, I'm not gonna die because the winter was hard, I stored all my food and it's all dried and it's made into pemmican or it's all been crushed and turned into flour. So what should have been a horrific event is not a horrific event. So human population was, was destined to grow once we had te technology and, uh, and, and culture and the capacity to pass information on through the gener generations. So I, I think it was inevitable. I mean, I, it, 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 one could have predicted it um, if you could have gone back a hundred thousand years. Um, and humans are just doing what humans do, which is trying to ensure their 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 future and their well well being. And in one case, that means moving, and in one case, it means putting walls up around your land and coming up with the concept of your land that no one else can, can trespass on. And coming up with the idea that if you do trespass on it, 
I can legitimately kill you and not be punished for it, right? right. Society says, oh, he was stealing your, your food. Yeah, okay. What are you, what are you gonna, it's his fault. Uh, so it, 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 there's all these sorts of things that have to fall into place that we think are natural, but that in fact are complete cultural constructions. Hmm. The first people to do it were probably, ah, uh, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say they were sociopaths, but they were they were people who were completely okay with, I'm okay, my neighbor's starving. Well, too bad. <laughs> no. right. You and I and most other people couldn't do that. We would take the hit and we would cut down what we eat so that our neighbor can get by too. But there are other people who would not care. Okay, on that point, um, something I remember hearing about the sort of Chinese communist revolution was that at the time there were a ton of different like sort of revolutionary groups. And one of them was the anarchists. And the anarchists actually had like a lot of sway, a lot of support. And yet they didn't, uh, because they were anarchists, they didn't develop an army. And so the communists sort of just like crushed them. And I'm curious if there's something kind of similar to what happened here, because when we talk about all these agricultural civilizations, as far as I'm aware, none of them developed in a way where people were just chill, sharing with each other. They didn't have the social stratification. And so maybe if there's like a 10% element of the population that is willing to sort of compete and backstab and dominate, maybe they just run roughshod over the rest. That's probably true. And if one looks at world leaders today, it's so often the case yet you say to yourself, this is the last person who ought to be in charge yeah. of, a, of a large nation, right? How did this person get to be in charge? Um, so there's an interplay here between what happens in society and human psychology. And there's variation among among humans in, in terms of their psychology, from Mother Teresa to, you know, uh, Ted Ted Kaczynski, right? These are two very different approaches to really the same problems of life. Yes. <laughs> so, and so humans run that that whole that whole gamut. Why I can't really tell you. Maybe there's something in their childhoods that sent one down this path and one down this path. All I know is that that range exists in humanity and mother Teresa would never be um, the leader of a country when it, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think, uh, unfortunately. Um, so many of these early States, most of them are expansionist. They're not happy with just, just holding, you know, Greece. Alexander has to push all the way into Persia, right? The Romans were not happy with just with just Rome. They're going to push out up to, well, almost Scotland, build Hadrian's Wall, and, and push out across much of Europe, much of Northern Africa. They're constantly expanding. One of the reasons they're expanding is that the person at the top has to be handing out sort of goodies to all the people underneath him. Yeah. And if he's not con keeping them happy, that's uh, he runs the risk of one of them trying to overthrow him. And history is full of this, full of this. And those those sort of lieutenants can sort of bring the masses to to help them in this by convincing the masses you'll do better under me than under the current guy. So. That's when you have violent overthrows of of governments, and it happens when governments are in are vested entirely in a person. Putin knows this. Putin knows this. Totally. He has to, he has to deliver stuff to the oligarchs. I I really thought that in the beginning of the Ukraine war, nations should have just taken what the oligarchs had: their yachts, their real estate, their bank accounts. They should have taken it. Right now, they're they're holding them because they're not really sure that international law allows them to take it. 
Right. I thought they should have just taken it. Just said, screw you guys. We're taking all your stuff. Putin would have been dead in a week. You think so? Oh, I think Putin would have been dead in a week. Yeah. The oligarchs would have said, you, you, you just, you, we lost all of our stuff because of what you did. Right. And now, and we don't have Ukraine. You said you were going to grab Ukraine in a week. It's been a year and a half. You haven't got it yet. So uh, I, I think if, I think now if, and they're debating it and on whether there's some international law that will allow them to actually take that stuff and keep it. Yeah. If you do that. Oh my God. The oligarchs, they'll kill Putin. I'm pretty confident. In that. Why? When you talk about these, these people at the top handing out power to their lieutenants and thereby maintaining their own power, why, why does it seem uh, less common for people at the top to go straight to the masses and just give them goodies? Um, I, I guess maybe you just need some organizational structure to like run a state and so they're necessarily going to be this lieutenant class. You can't just have a direct connection to the masses. Um, but I don't know. Does that seem strange to you? There have certainly been cases where those leaders have attempted to hand out stuff to the masses. Yeah. Evita did this by just handing out cash to uh, the, Argent, the Argentines. Yeah. Didn't, didn't work out so well, but, but, but she attempted to do that. I mean, in a sense, Putin is doing it in Russia today by offering people uh, salaries that are five times the going the going rate to go fight in Ukraine, mm. and a lot of them, their backs are against the wall. I mean, if somebody's offering you five times your your monthly salary to go fight, and your monthly salary is not enough to keep you alive, you're going to go fight. Right. So, so in a way, he's he's doing that by handing that that stuff out, that sort of stuff out. But he's going to get something for it. He's going to get cannon fire, basically. This this expansion of nation states is something that is so mind boggling to me because this happened within the past few hundred years. Uh, it is totally anomalous throughout the course of millions of years of of hominids walking across the earth, and it is so total. It, it's capture of, of the globe where. I'm pretty sure now that there's no bit of territory you can walk onto. Maybe it's contested by different states, but it's claimed by some state. And I, I think there are like uncontacted tribes in the Amazon, uh, but they belong technically to Brazil. Um, w w like, is is this shocking to you that this this phenomenon, this idea, has like taken hold so completely? I, I think even if you could have gone back into the past, I mean, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, uh, any place you walked would have been considered to be sort of the, my land by some group of, of, of people. Right. No matter, even if they weren't actually there, even if the, there was nobody actually there, they could still have said, that's, that's actually our ter 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 territory. And you would have to ask permission to to use it. And among hunter gatherers, if you ask permission, it's generally granted. Yeah. Because the assumption is, and the importance of asking permission, is it it's it establishes this very obvious debt between two groups of, of people. And it means we let you use our land this year, and next year, when the environmental tables are turned. And things are bad in our our home and good in your home, then um, we can we're going to call in the debt and we're going to move over into your land, yeah. and that's people would have you know accepted large tracts of land as their land. So the the Lakota at one point claimed a, a huge section of of the plains and. Nebraska, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, that was their land. And you don't cross it unless you ask permission. And that's something the American government never really, didn't really figure out. Right. Or at some, or at some point they just said, the hell with this. Right. There's gold in the Black Hills. 
we're going to take it, even though we made an agreement. Yeah. And, and is that something that is uh, entirely uncommon or um, was mostly restricted to uh, you, you see this mostly with like Western European settlers um, and colonizers and stuff like that of people just like totally breaking these kinds of agreements? Like, obviously, it would have been a huge deal to like Native Americans, but like, right. w- was it something that they could have expected that like, oh, maybe other tribes will like just ignore their uh, their territorial claims, things like that. Indigenous people did it to themselves, did it to each other. It's it's there. Yeah. It was happening a lot, actually, just before Europeans arrived, just before AD 1500. This was going on a great deal with people being shifted and moved around and a fair amount of violence going, going on um, because population had reached a it had really reached a peak around AD 1150 in in North North America. Um, so so it, it, this is not unique to Europe. Europe had probably the greatest impact on the on the world because they did it at, at a, on a global scale, right? Sun never said uh, on the British Empire there for a while. Right. They did it on a global scale, but everybody in the world has done this. I mean, African peoples did it, the Bantu expansion. They they move out and they just kind of, we're taking over, you know? Yeah. Taking over. Um, the, the Chinese have done it, everyone's. This is human, it's not Western, it's not Europe. It's yeah. not Europe. Trade. You, you say in, in the book that uh, agriculture sort of developed as hunter-gatherers were like trying to just be the best hunter-gatherers they could be. And so mm-hmm. this was a natural consequence of that. And, yeah. and you also suggest that as we're trying to be the best, you know, sort of democratic, capitalist, industrialists that we can be, uh, that something new will come out of this. Um, w- what do you think is going to happen? Okay. The point of the my my book, the fifth beginning, is is really to run the reader through these these four major uh, beginnings, these four major transitions in in human life. When 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 human life became unrecognizable, you know, a, a, a hunter gatherer of twenty five thousand years ago would not be able to recognize a horticultural village of say six or seven thousand year, years ago. That would have been utterly bizarre to them and likewise that horticultural village would would find the world of uh, of industrial society to be totally bizarre Com- they would have no idea what the heck is going going on so my point is that that process is not over most most students that i, I wrote this book because many of my students assume that Yes, all this stuff happened in the past, but now it's over. History's done. Yeah. What, what we have now is what's going to continue on forever. No, <laughs> the, the, the lesson of the past is that we'll make some other major transition in the, in the future. We'll, do, we'll become something completely different and probably unrecognizable to someone who lived in the 20th, 19th or 20th centuries and that that process is ongoing now and really started about AD 1500 which is the beginning of the whole process of globalization so what are we going to become yeah I'm an archaeologist my job is to look into the past and, and sort of tell you here's here's where we're at and that don't expect things to be the same so any politician who tells you they want to make America great again, they want to go back to where we were. I'm not sure where they want to go back to the 1950s with the repression of, of, of the rights of the civil rights of many, many people. <laughs> I don't think we want to go back there. Uh, so they, they, they want to go backwards when, in fact, we have to invent something completely new, something totally new. It's not, and whether we want it to happen or not, it's going to happen. So the question is, 
can we now, since we can recognize this, we've got history to look back on. We know that something is happening now. We know that the earth is, uh, the way that we organize the planet is going to change. How do we want it to change? What direction do we want it to go in? This is not something that anyone in the entire history of humanity, six million years of it, has ever been in the position to ask that question. Where do we want to go? What do we want the world to look like? And we have that, that capacity now. So one only has to say, what kind of world do you want to live in? I want to live in a world that's peaceful and prosperous, where um, there are not huge differences in the haves and the have have nots. I want to live in a world where people's lives are not decimated because they happen to get a, a disease through no fault of their own. Right. Or events happen to them that um, that's not their not their fault, or even it is their fault. They they did something foolish when they were when they were young. I don't want to live in a world where that sort of stuff. Where that where that still happens and it doesn't have to it doesn't have to so it it seems like all these these beginnings that you talk about it seems like a, maybe the core component of what brought them about was uh changes in technology um and depending on how broadly you want to define technology you know maybe democracy is like a form of social technology um maybe all these major changes have come about as a result of new technology. Um, and in you look out in the future, what can we expect? Uh, it, it would seem like if we go out into space and start venturing out there, th that would have to impact how we, you know, what is a nation state when the, the cosmos uh, is our home? Um, it feels like, maybe that's like the future. Um, but I don't know. You, I know you're in the business of the past, but feel yeah. free to indulge. <laughs> the, the future is, I mean, technology is going to play an important role in the future. Yeah. I, I, who knows what? I mean, I've got an iPhone sitting on my desk here. I, I, I mean, even 20 years ago, I wouldn't, I would never have guessed that I would have all the world's knowledge is sitting right here on my desk. Yeah. So um, technology is certainly going to, to play a role and we've got to think about how we're going to use that technology we see this discussion now with the use of uh, artificial intelli intelligence which we've got to think seriously about that we actually ought to think seriously about um, cell phones uh, also they should not be in the hands of young young children because uh, there's lots of great stuff there's also lots of terrible stuff <laughs> totally don't want them access having access to it. um so technology is going to play a role, but more important than technology. And that, and that most people think when they think about the future, all they think about is flying cars and stuff, right? Yeah. Really, the, the future that we have to think about is organization. How are we going to organize the planet? And that's not, um, that's actually not something new because when the United States was formed, and they decided to create a democracy that really didn't exist anyplace else in the world. And people had a hard time envisioning what, what could that be like? There were some people who wanted to, to make George Washington king because they couldn't imagine any other structure. Of, yeah. of course you have a king. That's, that's, that's the way these things go, right? But no, no, they were gonna create an office of president that people would move in and out of, that would contain certain certain powers and authority, but those didn't continue once you left the office. This was th this seems completely normal to you and I, and your listeners, but at the time it was just bizarre, a totally bizarre idea for for many many people. Yeah, and it was hard to construct it. We can see they. Those the founding fathers, you know, they were Madison and 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 Franklin Jefferson. They, these guys were brilliant and thought deeply about how to construct a government that would, oh, how do we put it, would would 
ensure that human shortcomings would not destroy it. Um, uh, and and uh, but they had to come up with something with something new. I mean, yeah, they used some ideas from from the Greeks and the Romans, but it was nothing like the Greeks and the Romans, really. I mean, some ideas, yes, the idea of a Senate and that sort of thing. Yeah. But in other ways, it's it was just totally different. They came up with something totally new. And it was brilliant. And it was a good idea. It still is a good idea. So we now have to think about how do we kind of take that to the next level, which is the global level. And we've, you know, of course, we've already started to work on it. The League of Nations was the beginning. Then we had the United Nations. We've got, you know, the International um, uh, uh, Court and all these sorts of international things, the whole Bretton Woods uh, agreements, this this yeah. sort of order that they were going to create for the whole world to operate in terms of. That's only been around since, you know, 1945. It's only and there's, there's huge fear of it, too, because I, even when, when you're saying this, there's a, a fear of, you know, oh, a one world government like that. That is a, a total boogeyman. And yep. it also, I mean, the course of human history is people trying to be like world conquerors and failing. And like the, the, the globe seems too much for any one hand to, to fully grasp. But sorts of international agreements, things like that, cooperation among people around the world, that, that seems fairly uh, at worst benign and at best really positive yes absolutely we do have a vision of of a of one world government as um as a horror i mean it's it's often the boogeyman in lots of science fiction yeah films and it's and it's usually because we envision it not being some constructed order but it's the product of one megalomaniac taking over the world right you know that was that was Alexander the Great's vision, it was Caesar's vision, it was Napoleon's vision, it was Hitler's vision, it, it was Stalin's vision, it's Putin's vision, um, it's probably Xi Jinping's uh, vi vi vision, although he wants to do it in a different way. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's the only model we have to go on. Yeah. We can construct something completely different. It's not impossible. Robert Kelly, I think that is a fantastic note to end it on. Uh, we went well over an hour, but in, in the best way possible. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, the book is The Fifth Beginning. Um, you you have other books out as well. Uh, is there a website people can go uh, to reach you or find out more? Uh, uh, if they want to reach me, they can easily find me through the University of Wyoming. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Robert, thank you once again for your time. Oh, thank, thank you. I, I appreciate it.